Well, good morning, everybody. I want to read to you in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, to be specific. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving wrath. New believers, what an amazing and confusing time in the life of a Christian, am I right? I've been blessed to be a Christian for quite some time, and I've had the ability to see so many people come to Christ and walk through the phase of being a new believer. There are so many questions when it uh, when you mature through this time. And maybe some of you are there right now. Maybe some of you are, are new Christians, new believers, asking lots of questions. Paul addresses some of these questions uh, here in Ephesians when he's talking uh, to the church of Ephesus. In the beginning of this book, in chapter 1 specifically, Paul explains the salvation process. And then in chapter 2, gets to the part where he explains what we are saved from in Christ Jesus. He says in Ephesians here, it says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, who is Satan. And then it goes on to say, and also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. See, we were saved and we were saved from three specific things, the grasp of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm so thankful for Pastor CJ for lots of different reasons. Uh, number one, last week he talked to you a little bit about himself and said uh, that, you know, he, you know, I said that he was um, patient and that he was peaceful and those things, and then he kind of downplayed it. But I just want to and, and confirm to you that uh, CJ is one of the most patient and peaceful people that I know. I have had an office right next to his for the last almost three years, so I feel like I'm a good, you know, reference for that. And uh, he is very patient and he is peaceful. He seeks that more than anybody else. And then CJ went on to say something about me and how, you know, I'm not like that. Um, and I mean, he's not wrong per se, you know, whereas he might be someone who fights more for peace, I don't mind kind of just like jumping into the war part to get to the peace, you know, because I like peace too, but I don't mind going through a little bit of mud in order to get there. So that's kind of our personality. So um, when I put this series, when we put this series together, um, Pastor Brian said, hey, I want you guys to do a, a series where you co, you co write, co preach or whatever. And so we came up, I was like, how can we really, really um, use our giftings, our natural tendencies? And I was like, man, He's more like peace. I'm like, we're like peace and war. And they do peace. You know, so that's, that's how you got where we are at today. I'm also thankful for CJ because this week we had the opportunity to take the high schoolers to Cedar Point. And I don't really like roller coasters that much. Um, he loves roller coasters. And he also likes to drive. So, <laughs> so I was like, hey, CJ, you want to be my other chaperone? And uh, it worked out nice. I held the bags and read my Kindle for about eight hours while they rode roller coasters. It was a good day, not complaining. So I'm thankful for Pastor CJ in a lot of ways, and um, that's just one of the big ones. So, um, so thanks, CJ, for being you, because you're awesome. Uh, this message that I'm going to preach to you today is of huge importance to the Christian, because I would label it as foundational to what we believe, all right? The life of a Christian has what's called duality, duality. That's a hard word for me to say, that and the word rural, rural duality and rule. It's hard for me to say those words. Anyways, now you know a little bit about words I have trouble saying. And so there's a duality. I mean, there are two sides to the Christian life, right? We must live in both worlds to have a healthy and balanced view of our situation. The side of peace, being an advocate for peace, being someone who lives to desire peace in our lives and others. But then there's also the whole side of war, that we are currently in a war with the enemy of our souls, so how can we be people who are constantly at peace, fighting for peace, while at war and fighting a war? There's a duality to how we live as Christians. We must live in peace and security in Christ, but also advocate for peace in the world around us and our own personal lives. 
we would be making a fatal mistake if we forgot about the war going on next to us. In 2 Kings, the Old Testament, chapter 6, verse 17, there's a great story in there um, about Elisha. Do you guys know who Elisha is? Okay. Do you guys know who Elijah is? More, but still. Uh, So Elisha comes after the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. Okay? And he says he kind of handed the baton to Elisha. So Elisha is in the valley and they're fighting, Israel is fighting, the Israelites are fighting against what's called Aram. It's an an ancient kingdom. And the kingdom of Aram are coming against Israel and so you have uh, Elisha and his servant down there and all of a sudden these armies come over the hill and they're coming at them and and Elisha's just like chilling, right? And uh, his servant's freaking out, like, uh, we're going to die. This is it. This is the end. We're not going to make it. You know, can you just imagine him scurrying around the tent, like, back in his bags, trying to run away, right? And Elisha's like, calm down, calm down. It's okay. And his servant's like, what are you talking about? And he said, it's fine. There's more of them, more help on our side than theirs. And he's like, what are you talking about? He says, just wait. He says, God. Elisha says, God. Open his eyes so that he can see what's really going on around him. And all of a sudden, instantly in front of him, his eyes are open and he sees the armies of Aram still, but surrounding the armies of Aram is the heavenly armies. Chariots of fire, swords, blazing, shields, angelic hosts around fighting for them and defending them. And they end up winning, right? They end up, through miraculous design, winning that war. His eyes are open and he can see. See, we are at war today. And I want to tell you about your enemy and how you must armor up and fight back if you want to win. You guys want to win the war, right? Oh, wow. Well, I guess that's the end. (laughs) Uh, You guys want to win the war, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to help you do that today. Our sin nature has two effects on us as humans, all right? Sin nature. We fall under the sinful effects of the world around us by nature, uh, and then because it's the space that we occupy, that we live in. And then the second one is that we are subject to sin nature that lives inside of us. That's a corruption of our DNA, which I will refer to as the flesh. So we have the world and the flesh. The world is a force that kind of pushes on us from the outside, and our flesh is something that kind of pushes out from the inside, if that's kind of a simplified way of understanding it. And see, our flesh nature affects every single one of us because we are all sinful. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So I want to talk to you first about the world. We'll go through these three different different enemies that are fighting against us. In Genesis 3.14, it's the creation story, uh, we get just past the creation and we get past the temptation and the eating of the fruit, and God says, because you have done this, and what had they just done? They had eaten the fruit, that's right. Don't say apple, we don't know it was an apple, okay, and apples are really good, all right, and now every time I eat an apple, I think, well, is this what did us in? Like, maybe we shouldn't eat this anymore, you know? It was a fruit, okay? Just be safe. It was a fruit. And so he says, these are the consequences for eating the fruit. And that's, we have pain in childbirth. Women have pain in childbirth. The work will become toil to us. Weeds and thistles will begin to fill the ground. And the world begins to decline into destruction. Killing and death become not only part of life, but a necessary part as we seek to have meat to eat. As we see animals that used to live in peace, as they say the lion and the lamb lie down together, we see them begin to fight and kill, right? Because of sin corruption in the world. See, sin looks in the world a lot like this. It looks like physical violence around us. Do you think maybe physical violence is increasing around us at all times? The world is a much more violent place than I remember it when I was younger. It looks like selfish behavior. We see people maybe cutting you off in traffic or people making selfish decisions around you. Sometimes even our own family members are being selfish, looking out for their own needs instead of the needs of others first. We see this natural uh, kind of world sin around us that affects everybody. We see the world begin to collapse in on itself with nature, violence, and ever-increasing, more destructive uh, natural disasters occurring around us. And more frequently, we see the world falling. This is a result of sin entering the world. 
From the time Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it didn't just affect us, it affected the world that we live in, the creation we exist in. And the world itself began to be corrupt. We hear about this in Revelation, how there's a new heaven and a new earth. God eventually comes and makes it all new again, sin-free. But since that day in the garden, we have begun a downward spiral in the earth and creation as it's tainted by sin. So that's the world, what's happening around us, right? The second is flesh, the flesh. Romans seven fifteen through 20 is one of my favorite verses. I'm going to read it to you. I need you to hang on. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who live, sorry, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. I love that verse. You know why I love that verse? As a writer, there are two things that you want to do when you're writing something. Number one, you need to convey the information that needs to be passed on. Paul does a great job of this. He always does that, right? Very informational. But number two, the secondary goal is to convey the feelings and emotions going on with the passage as you're writing it. And this sounds like a madman, right? And isn't the frustration of living in our sinful flesh maddening? How we know what we want to do and we want to chase after Jesus and we want to love others and we want to serve others. But the next thing you know, you've forgotten about Jesus. You've already cut somebody off in traffic because you were more worried about getting your own coffee before somebody else. Isn't it maddening? I think Paul really catches the essence of this as he writes this scripture. That it's so frustrating as he wants to do what he wants to do, but he can't because of his sin nature, his flesh. See, just as the world is tainted by sin in the garden, so were we. To the very core, we are the ones who ate the fruit. Yeah, now Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the garden, but we would have all made the same choice. That's the moral of the story. See, that sin penetrated our DNA and forever causes our flesh to cry out in rebellion to what God has for us. We naturally rebel to whatever God has for us because of our flesh corruption. See, what we want is largely driven by our sin flesh natures. I want to tell you a little story about how corrupt even our DNA is, even subconsciously. We don't even know that it's happening. I have two favorite foods in the entire world. Number one, bread. Number two, sugar. Okay? Naturally. So, uh, you know, we uh, have these foods that we like. And so I, 10 years ago, did this uh, fitness thing. Um, we had gotten married, and I had gained a little bit of weight, okay, as you do when you first get married. And so I did this fitness challenge. And they did like a blood test and some other stuff to find out foods that Ryan should not ever eat, right? Guess what were the two foods? Yeah, they are like... If you want to live, don't eat bread or sugar, right? I might be a little overdramatic. But, I mean, I even had biblical support for that, you know, like the bread of life and the sugar of the sweetness of salvation mixed together into one delicious donut filled, <laughs> filled, filled, with, uh, filled with raspberry filling like the blood of Christ that comes out of our... Amen. But no... It's so funny, though, because even my genetics, right? Even my genetics are like, eat the bread, eat the sugar, eat the bread, eat the sugar. When my body is saying, no, don't eat the bread, don't eat the sugar, right? My genetics are corrupted. And this sounds funny, but to the very core of who I am, sin has made me make even desire bad decisions in that way. See, Proverbs fourteen twelve says, there is, a wi- r- there is a way that seems right to a man but leads to death. Hmm. Even our bodies break down and fight against themselves. Think about how sin has kind of created these sexually transmitted diseases and they get passed to people through sin as they started, but then they got corrupted even more and sometimes people get them innocently doing nothing wrong through blood transfusions or anything like that and how it just corrupts our DNA, begins to attack 
our insides, right? Just our, our body begins to break down. Think about even this, something that has nothing to do with our, our actions in sinful nature, just in the way our bodies are. Cancer. Cell reproduction is something that our bodies were designed to do. God created them that way. So as our cells die, they multiply, right? And, and, re, and resupply themselves. Well, cancer is this done at a crazy rate in which our bodies get these masses and they cause our bodies to break down because the body is doing what it was designed to do except in a broken and tainted way because of sin. See, this is just sin that we, or this is just sin nature that we've inherited because of our DNA. It has nothing to do with our own sin that we do day in and day out. Our bodies, our genetics are corrupted because of sin entering the world. See, we also have these sin desires too. It causes us to desire sinful things. It causes us, like I said, to want the opposite of what God has for us. We seek to satisfy, satisfy our flesh first and foremost. In fact, in Matthew 4, we hear about how Jesus took himself into the desert to purify himself from the temptation of the flesh, right? He goes into the desert. He's like, you know, in my last series I preached, we talked about Jesus being fully human. He said, this flesh thing is going to be bad. So I'm going to go ahead early in my ministry. I'm going to go into the desert. And I'm not going to eat or drink. And I'm going to basically tell my flesh who's boss. And it's not going to cause me any problems, right? Out there he meets Satan. And you know the story, right? But he says early on, I'm going to take control of this. We have the same thing going on, right? Has anybody ever gone on a diet, right? You can't eat something for a week or whatever. That first three days is bad, but by day four, it's terrible. Your brain starts telling you things like, if you don't eat something, you are going to die, right? You're going to die. We can't do this any longer. We're running out of juice. When you know very well, you could probably go a month or so without eating because, you know, you, you packed it in for a while, right? And so it's time to slow it down. It's time to pay the piper, right? And our bodies do this. The other is working out. Like, so I, I used to run a little bit. If you see me running now, you should probably be running too because there's probably something terrible behind me. But, um, but I used to run quite a bit and I would get to it. And I'm just not designed to run. Uh, I don't, it just doesn't work for me. And so my body would be like, all right, this is the end. You, you've chosen death, you know. And it'd start, my brain would start telling me these things. Like, you know, I told you a mile back there, a mile ago that, you know, your lungs are given out and your heart's going to explode and nobody's going to find you for a while out here in the middle of the country running. And so, like, your brain starts playing these tricks, but you have to push through it. And once you push through it, you realize that, oh, that was just my flesh screaming out. I feel better. I'm in shape. I'll, I'll do that again probably, right? And so we have these moments where we realize that our flesh is lying to us. And once we push through, that we're in a good place. See, our flesh seeks to satisfy our need for immediate gratification and is a self-centered nature. If we just listen to our flesh each and every day, probably most of us would sit on the couch, watch some Netflix, and eat some potato chips, right? Maybe that's just me. Maybe I shouldn't say that a lot because now you know my natural tendency. But we have to fight against that to go to work, to do what we have to do, right? And not listen, listen to our fleshly desires. Our flesh just wants immediate gratification, self-centered nature, and to just maintain, right? That's our flesh. So we've talked about the world. We've talked about the flesh. And now we need to talk about the third enemy. That's the devil and his demons. Now, the devil has pulled the wool over our eyes and done a great job of it. Okay, I want to give you some statistics. And Barna Research is a group that they uh, focus on um, like Christian research, so like that's really reliable. You can go on their website and find all sorts of statistics and research that they've done. But in 2002, Barna Research reported that six out of 10 Americans, 59%, reject the existence of Satan, the idea of that, indicating that the devil or Satan is merely just a symbol of evil. Now, in 2009, they did the study again, and Barna reported that 59% of professing Christians also rejected the existence of Satan. Professing Christians. So, professing Christians now have the same likelihood of believing in Satan as somebody who's non, not a Christian, right? No different than the world. And now here's the disturbing part of that study. In 2009, only 20 6% of Christians, evangelical Christians, 
agreed that they believe, strongly agreed that they believe is Satan real. So you know you have those surveys, you can tick the box like, don't know, agree, strongly agree. Only 26% of them indicated that they strongly agree that Satan is real. Only a quarter of the church statistically believes that Satan is real. Satan has done a mighty work, hasn't he? In tricking even Christians that he is not real. The word Satan in Hebrew actually means adversary. It means one who's against you, who's coming up against you, fighting against you. Devil is actually a Greek word that means slanderer. The one who whispers lies in your ears to you and about you. I want to straighten out some details about who Satan is and just exactly the power he has. Number one, he is created and he is not eternal. He's an angel that has fallen who God made. He is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. And he is not omniscient, meaning he's not all-powerful, he's not always present, and he's not all-knowing. So don't give him those attributes, please. He cannot tempt you into uh, hell. He doesn't have that kind of power. He's not around you at all times because he's only one thing. Maybe some of his demons might be. He does have a host of army following, a host of demons with him. And he's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything that you're thinking, right? He cannot read your thoughts. So he can't hear what you're thinking in your head, right? That's one reason why when we pray out loud against him, we have to do that because he can't hear you pray that. God can hear you pray that, but he can't hear you pray that when you speak in the power of Jesus' name that he has to flee. He can't hear you do that unless you say it out loud off your lips. He was defeated at the cross, amen? But he roams dangerously as an adversary to Christians until Christ's return. We need to be aware because he still roams, prowling to devour as many of us as he can. You see, he desires one thing, and that's to destroy Jesus. That was Satan's main goal. Now, on the cross, he failed to do that. Satan had this plan to end Jesus, to cause that to happen. Unknowingly, Satan just fulfilled Christ's plan that he would die for us, right? And so, probably that's frustrating to Satan, would be my guess. So now he is on plan B for us, which that is to destroy Christians and to destroy the church with the time that he has left. He knows he's buying his time. He knows he loses the battle at the end, all right? So he's trying to destroy as many of us as he can before he gets there. You also need to know, know that Satan is the voice in your ear that tells you lies. Maybe some of you have heard these lies in the past, like, you're no good, you're not going to make it, you're a terrible person, people know who you really are, you're a fake, you know, you're never going to amount to anything in your life, you're just uh, a waste of space, the world would be better off without you, and then these lies start to creep in. You should just kill yourself, because nobody even wants you around anyways, you're a failure. Maybe you've heard those lies whispered in your ear, and I want to tell you something right now. That is the voice of the devil in your ear. And some of you who may not believe, maybe you're part of that 75% statistic, you're like, oh, about this whole devil thing, right? Well, let me just tell you this. Even science will confirm this, that the human body, the human conscience has one desire at its core. Take away spirituality, take away everything. The human existence has one desire at its core, and that is to live, right? Your body, from the very mammal part of your brain and heart, wants to live. It does everything it can to protect itself to live, Right? So if your psyche and your body has one desire, and that's for you to live, there's no way that the idea of you killing yourself or you ending your life comes from you. It doesn't come from your brain. Okay? It comes from the enemy. That's the one, the one place left that it can come from. There is an enemy. His name is Satan, and he wants to kill you. That's the truth. Okay? He is the third enemy that we're talking about in this war. So we've talked about uh, who's at, we're at war with. We're at war with the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So what? So what, Ryan? You've talked about these enemies, whatever. Um, so what? Well, I've given you all a chance to respond now, okay? You have, the way I see it, am I as three choices. So I'm going to lay those out for you so that you have to make a choice today before you leave this place, okay? Number one choice. Deny that you are at war. Stay, you know, wool over your eyes and just say, this is a little far-fetched. Seems a little too, like you've read too many fantasy novels, Ryan. 
a little too much Lord of the Rings. You need to lay low for a while, you know, and chill out. You might say that. Sure, okay. But you like Jesus, don't you? He's pretty cool. That's probably why you're here. Some sort of respect for that man, right? Well, Jesus talked about and described Satan over 20 times in his ministry on earth. So if you deny Satan and everything I just described to you, you're denying what Jesus talked about. Also, the Bible talks about Satan or the devil over 37 different times. Denying the spiritual battle taking place and Satan's work around here denies Jesus' testimony in the entire Bible. So just consider that as you take the option to deny what's going on around you, that you are denying what Jesus said about it and therefore minimalizing what he said in total. Now, the second option is also one that I don't suggest, and it's the hyper other end of that, and that's to only focus on the spiritual war going on around you. It's the total end of the other spectrum, and you might have seen people do this before. In fact, it's like the whole there's a devil in every bush kind of mentality, like, oh, I got fired from my job. The devil must have done it. Or maybe it's because you didn't show up to work for a week, you know? Maybe it's less to do with the devil, more to do with bad decisions, right? So we have to really be careful about that. We don't want to go hyper the other way because it causes something to happen in our lives that is really sad and not what Jesus intends at all. We lose sight of the world that we live in now because we're so focused on the spiritual world. We lose sight of the good things like the people around us that God's given us, his beautiful creation and nature and, and the things we have around us that he gave to us to enjoy and the situations around you. You lose focus on really loving those around you, experiencing God in those situations because you're so focused on the war. The third option and the one that I would suggest and the one I'm most excited about with for you guys today is the third one, which I call armor up and fight. This is the best solution in my opinion, to realize that there's a war going on around you and fight back. But also realize that we are people of peace who seek peace in our lives. The church and the lives of others. So how do I armor up and fight back, Ryan? I agree with you. This is the best option. What do I do? Well, let me tell you. Number one, pray the armor of God. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the sword of the spirit, and the shield of faith. Pray that out loud in the power of Jesus' name when you wake up in the morning and notice a difference in your life as you've asked for Jesus to put those on for you. Now, you might feel kind of silly at first, right? Because you're like, okay, I'm praying the armor of God on me. But those spiritual pieces of armor will go on you and protect you from the spiritual war going on around you. Now, if you got up every morning and you put on an actual suit of armor, physical suit of armor, I might laugh at you because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, are we? We're fighting against kingdoms and principalities of the air, the world around us, the, the spiritual battle going on. So we put on spiritual armor. Pray that that uh, the armor of God in the power of Jesus' name. Secondly, pray in the power of Jesus' name out loud. Pray out loud in the name of Jesus. John 14, 13 through 14 says, and I will do, this is Jesus, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So he'll do anything you ask in his name so that the Father is glorified through the Son. That's the only requirement. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it with the understanding that it's for the glory of God. God wants you to be protected from the spiritual battle going on around you more than anything. And it is 100% of the time okay for you to ask out loud in the power of Jesus' name to protect you for that armor, to protect you from the devil, to ask in the power of Jesus' name for the devil to go out of there and his demons to get out of there. Ask in the power of Jesus' name and he will answer you. The third thing to armor up is keep your spiritual eyes open. Pray that your eyes are open like Elisha's servant. Now, you might be thinking like, maybe I'll put the armor of God on and I'll just be like, walk around like this. You know, like, okay, well, if I don't see the devil, he can't see me. <laughs> right? No. Keep your spiritual eyes open so that you can see the spiritual battle going on around you at all times. You see, when we do this, we'll begin to live in this world that we live both in our world but also see the spiritual world around us. See, when you realize that you are war, at war, you have to find out who your enemy is. You have to know your enemy. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's time to armor up for the fight, to pray the armor of God, to pray in the power of Jesus' name, and to keep your spiritual eyes open. When you do this, 
you'll be ready to fight for peace and be strong enough to win the war. Let's pray. Jesus, right now we come before you and we ask one thing that you'd open our eyes so that we could see like Elisha's servant Saul on that day fighting Aaron. God, you are the God of promises and the keeper of promises, and and you say that anything we ask in your name that you'll do. So right now in the power of Jesus' name, I pray over uh, the church here today that they would see the spiritual battle going on around them and that they would fearlessly run into battle for you, Jesus, for the sake of pursuing your peace in your peace on this earth, Jesus. God, I thank you. I thank you for who you are, for your promises, for being the God who doesn't say, yeah, there's a war going on around us, good luck. But you say, not only is there a war going on, but I've given you some armor to put on, and then here's your sword and a shield, and I'm going to be fighting right next to you. I'm not a leader that just sends my people out to fight for me. I fight right next to you. Jesus, thank you for being that Savior for us. God, thank you for leading the way as we fight sin, as we fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. Thanks for leading the way on the cross, for showing us just exactly what it takes to fight. And Jesus, thank you for loving us through this battle. Without your power, we'd be nothing. So help us to do what we want to do and what you called us to do, and to win the war against sin by fighting in your name and your power, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.